Q, Queen's student television show. I'm Shari Ross. And I'm Graham Abbey. On this week's show, you'll find out what's up with the AMS Parent Resource Center and how Queen's students are dealing with Blue Jay fever. But before that, our first story looks at the full referendum. And as we told you last Friday, all questions passed with a yes vote except for one. And here's Alison Grant with the details. On Tuesday night, ASSIS held a special press conference to discuss last week's referendum vote on funding for surface. I am also an elected representative, and I think that I'm not here to assess my moral feeling of what students feel. I am an elected person to act on behalf of students, and I ran on that platform, and I'm going to follow that platform. Steve's announced a special general meeting on November 4th to present motions ratifying the referendum's no uh, vote. Well, I hope that students come and that they um, come and ask questions about uh, the ASSIS executive's feelings on it, and I hope also that students will respect the results of the referendum. Steve's is pessimistic about satisfying both the yes and the no side's demands. I don't think there is any way that both sides can come out happy. I think Surface went into the referendum not really expecting a no vote, and I think that the no side went into the referendum expecting a no vote, and unfortunately, surface was wrong. It was 55% of the people voted no, so obviously there's going to be some great disappointment there. And I think as some people who didn't vote and who didn't realize the peril that, this, that the paper was in are really upset now, and I can understand. Surface's editor voiced his disappointment with the referendum results. It's silencing, basically. Um, it gives a message to minorities and, and people who are marginalized in the community that their voices do not want to be heard and that their opinions and their viewpoints um, are not accepted in society and will do everything to stop this. Lagdapon believes the no vote may be due to unfair campaign tactics. What I'm angry about is that um, how the no campaign used um, special code words like funding, like um, Anti, anti, you know, reverse discrimination, and and they use that in such a way to slant the, what the what the reality is. However, so members like of the that, No campaign that, say that, that students that have voiced their opinion and want the decision to stand. We feel that the people have gone out, the people have spoken, and uh, any efforts to um, to oppose what the majority of people here at Queens say on November fourth will be taken with uh, with much disdain. Other media sources on campus worry about the possible implications arising from the no vote. What's going on now is a precedent because, well, I suppose it's not in terms of the general sense of things, but it's the majority repressing a minority voice on campus, and that, that frightens me. Other referendum results sparked less controversy. The student constables, USA, and special needs um, received student positive. support. Um, I think it shows that there's a lot of support and encouragement out there um, for peer supervision. And so it's great to see that the students are, are supporting us in such a big way. Last week's referendum vote made it clear that a majority of arts and science students did not want to continue funding for surface. Yet the future of the paper still remains undecided. Until November 4th has come and gone, the debate and the controversy will continue. For Studio Q, I'm Allison Grant reporting. Coming up on Studio Q, who do you want to send to Ottawa? Studio Q checks out some of the candidates for Kingston and the Islands. Last spring, the AMS launched initiatives to establish a parent resource centre here on Queen's campus. Despite optimism about the plans, the doors to the centre here in JDUC have remained closed. Kathy? Thanks, Graham. I was handed this assignment four weeks ago with a simple task, to find out why the centre hasn't opened. As a result of my investigation, I found out there is no simple reason. The Parent Resource Centre has been derailed due to poor organization and an inability to follow through on what were highly ambitious plans. The Resource Centre is located in the heart of the JDUC, prime retail space that until last year was the home of the college book merchant. The spark behind the project for the AMS last year was Liz Mugga. Together with the university, she commissioned a study to look into the feasibility of such a project. Its mandate was to look at such things as the demand, staff requirements, cost, and government regulations. I think that it's a matter of priorities, and we are dealing with an increasing mature student and single parent um, population on campus, and that this is clearly a need that has to be addressed. Although it was oh, intended sorry. to be a top priority, today the center is still empty. The only thing that occupies it are a few donated couches and a haphazard display of pamphlets. 
In an interview last week, Todd Minerson, who took over for Liz Mega, says the center's objectives are still on track. Um, ideally, like I said, it would be a place for parents to bring their children on campus uh, if they have to do some readings or if they're stuck on campus looking after their child. Uh, it's a place where they can come. Hopefully it'll be staffed by one volunteer at least. Uh, there's toys, books, coloring, paper, crayons, all that kind of stuff. But just what is its role on campus? Studio Q wasn't able to get a copy of the feasibility study, but it appears the present plans for the center will do little to meet the needs for daycare on campus. The main reason is the lack of money. In order to look after children like at other daycare centers in Kingston, the AMS would have to hire a professional child care worker. Without one, student volunteers can't even babysit unless the parent is present at all times. Some mature students we spoke with student. felt the service was it's virtually useless. I'm with them there, but I have to be able to go to classes. So there wouldn't really be much of a sense to bring my children to school just to spend time with my children. We can spend pretty good time at home or doing other things on our own. Although the AMS had good intentions in regard to the Parent Resource Center, it doesn't look as though it's going to open anytime soon, which is a shame because there are several other Queen's organizations which could have made better use of the space. So, Kathy, if I was a parent here in the Kingston community, how would the Resource Center help me, or in fact, would it at all? Well, Graham, in a lot of ways it probably wouldn't, because it's not a daycare center. You cannot bring your child to this Parent Resource Center and leave them there. You must stay there with them. So therefore, in a lot of ways, it's not very practical and it's providing little more of a service than you would get at your own home. So there you have the story behind the closed doors here in the JDUC. Thanks very much, Kathy. Thanks. Three men sexually assaulted a Queen's student on Saturday night. They approached on King Street and led her into an alleyway. Fortunately, she was able to escape from her assaulters and give a full description of them to the police. The first suspect is slim, six foot one, with dark hair and dark eyes. The second has sandy brown hair and is stocky at five foot nine. The third male is five foot eleven with medium brown hair and a larger nose. If you have any information, call Crime Stoppers at 634-2293 or Kingston Police at 549-4660. Women's issues don't have borders. That's the message from Sanara Tabani, president of the National Action Committee on the Status of Women. She spoke here on Tuesday, and Studio Q got an exclusive interview. Here's Justine Ray with more. On Tuesday, October 19th, members of the Queen's community attended a lecture at Grant Hall, given by Sanara Tambani, the director of the National Action Committee on the Status of Women. Largely through the initiative of past director Judy Rebick, NAC has been trying to increase its representation of the diversity of Canadian women. This has often come under attack, however, by those who feel alienated by these changing objectives. Despite these attacks, Tabani aims to continue with this diversified approach. And, you know, I think that if women who have belonged to NAC in the past start leaving the organization because the organization now speaks for more women and is more inclusive, then we have to look at whether we had the same goals in the first place. One of the goals Tabani plans to emphasize during her role as director is to commit NAC to an increasingly global perspective, which she views as a key necessity for the future of the women's poverty, movement. Because, you know, the fight back has to be global because the attack on women's rights is global. In terms of her views on the upcoming federal election, Tabani feels that women's issues have been given a secondary role. So I think the problem is that the politicians are not responding to the interest which is out there. And, uh, you know, uh, we have done, we've put out a voters guide which, uh, you know, lists all of the issues which we feel are central to women's equality. That voters guide sold out and we've had to go into second printing. Tabani feels that without NAC's aggressive stance, fewer advancements will be made towards gender equality. Younger women in particular must understand the importance of this approach for future generations. And I think young women are realizing faster <laughs> that, uh, you know, they can't take equality for granted or that the women's movement is not passe but is very much necessary in this day and age. The impression Mr. Banny wanted to leave with the Queen's student body is an increased recognition that organizations must be working in coalitions in order to stop the kind of attack we see on equality rights in this country. With the election over and done with by Monday, Tabani should have more time available to devote to her own vision of where NAC should be heading within the next two years. For Studio Q, this is Justine Ray reporting. Vandals spray painted a number of cars in the ghetto over the weekend. Most of the cars targeted were on the north end of Earl Street. Kingston police made no arrests in relation to this incident, and the cost of damage isn't known. Paula Kaplan spoke on Monday night at Grant Hall. She 
She is an assistant professor of psychiatry at the Ontario Institute of Studies in Education, and she lectures in women's studies at the University of Toronto. Kaplan spoke about her book, Lifting a Ton of Feathers, dealing with the barriers facing women in the academic world. The Human Rights Office co-sponsored the talk for Women's History Month. He invited us to a speech party. TV Ontario yes. awarded Queen students for their excellence in film. Purple Jesus, a film about alcoholism on campus, took first place in the long documentary category. Tom Costain directed the production, and Michael Lawson produced the film made entirely on Queen's campus. This weekend's homecoming, and there's a lot going on around campus, and here's a brief rundown of some of the things you won't want to miss. On Saturday, you can watch History in the Making as the cornerstone of the new store for library is laid down at the corner of University and Union. That starts at 11 a.m. and is followed by an AMS charity barbecue and pep rally at 11.30. This event is taking place at Victoria School parking lot. Also on Saturday afternoon, the Golden Gales play the McGill Redmond in a combined Kill McGill homecoming game at Richardson Stadium. Game time is 1 p.m. The Lesbian and Gay Association is celebrating its 20th anniversary at the Grad Club in the Rosebud Room. Festivities take place from 1 to 4 on Saturday. And be sure to check out the concert in Jock Harty Arena Saturday night. The lineup includes the Stonecutters, Eric's Trip, and the Pursuit of Happiness. It's a benefit for Kingston Food Bank. And after all the partying is over, students are invited to help clean up. You can show up at the corner of University and Union Sunday morning at 10.30 to make Kingston and Queen's campus clean again. Hi, this is Taser Lawrence with What's On Wear. First of all, starting on the home front with Alfie's. Thursday night kicks off the weekend with a Con Ed smoker. Friday, check out the Commerce 95 smoker. Saturday is the Arts 94 smoker. Next week, come and see the Spiders Monkeys and Fat Spider on Tuesday. Don't miss the AIDS benefit on Wednesday featuring me, Mum, and Morgan Tyler. At the shot, don't miss the Blue Jays take the World Series on the big screen. Become a member of the Century Club on Bedhead Fridays. Storm the shot on Saturday for the Gales game. Tuesday night, the shot celebrates the invention of the condom while the Blue Knight Jazz Band plays on. What's on Wear now takes you downtown to Dr. Gertie's. Check out the Resident Social on Thursday night. And on Saturday, the doctor will be providing bus service to and from the Gales game, followed by a Purple Haze party. Night prices from 7 to 11 p.m. Looking for a little live music? Don't miss Will Smokey Log playing all weekend long, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday at the Toucan. Sunday presents one of Kingston's favorite local bands, the Mahones. Catch the Jays and Phillies battle for the world champion title on the QP's Jumbotron. Seinfeld and Simpsons on Friday afternoon starting at 2 p.m. And the QP's new unplugged Saturday nights beginning October 30th. That's all folks for What's On Wear this weekend. Have a great homecoming. As election day looms closer and closer, many of you may still be undecided voters. Studio Q spoke to the candidates of the major political parties running in Kingston and the islands. Here's Kevin Rex with the details. Decision 93. Canada's federal election is almost upon us. The outcome of this election, perhaps more than any other in recent memory, will profoundly affect the lives of young people across the country. So as students at Queen's prepare to go to the polls on October 25th, we decided to find out what issues concern them the most. Uh, the funding for education. Since we were here to get education and we're not going to have someone that's going to give it to us, then we're screwed. And that's going to affect how I vote. Well, obviously more funding for um, positions for uh, professors. I'm a master's stu uh, PhD student now. And um, so I'm interested in the job market in the future. And so definitely a stop to the freeze on hiring. So more funding for professors for positions for me to go into. Well, I think it's very important to see what they're going to do for the education and if there's going to be any funding for the education as well as what's going to happen with external affairs. I'm not sure that the leaders presently will be able to effectively represent Canada. I just don't agree that tuition hikes are a big deal if we've still got a big deficit. So we've got to get down the deficit and we can't be asking for money for nothing. The big question is, of course, underfunding. Students want to know what the various parties plan to do if elected. Peter Milliken, a Queen's grad and the Liberal candidate and current MP for Kingston and the Islands, had this to say about university funding. However, some of the proposals that our parties put forward in this election touch on education and are in fact very important. One, uh, we've agreed uh, as part of our program that transfer payments to the provinces will be subject to an agreement, a five-year agreement between the federal government and the provinces, which the federal government will abide by. And that should help alleviate the uh, cutbacks to universities. 
Barry Gordon, the PC candidate and a native Kingstonian, was a bit more optimistic. So Queen's University, uh, you know, did a unbelievable job this summer raising a hundred million dollars themselves from the private sector so uh, that's certainly fantastic uh, we need to to be in touch with our our education system uh, the conservative government is proposing an increase in grants for uh, education for both full and part-time students and also addressing some of the special needs for people that have uh, unique circumstances sean mcadam is a second year politics student at queens he's also the reform party candidate he too considers underfunding a major what problem. What like to see happen is get the deficit out of the way and, and you know, start to work on this massive debt problem that we have. And uh, this will free up tax dollars to, to put towards education. Marianne Higgs is the NDP candidate. She's also a Queens grad and former winner of the prestigious Tricolor Award. She says she can sympathize with the plight of students. I myself took nine and a half years to pay off my original undergrad student loan because I had a family, because I went on to a master's degree before I came back to Queens for a law degree. So I, I want students to appreciate that I really do know what it's like to struggle to pay for your education, to be concerned about what you will do in your life after university. Students who are preparing to graduate seem to have only one thing on their mind, jobs. And as most of the candidates will admit, the future does not look very bright. My view is if, if we go on a course of deficit reduction a la reform or a la Tory, uh, we will have no jobs for years. I mean, I think it's a very, very serious problem. It's tough. Society makes it tough on us. Some of the things that the government do make it tough on us. I think our media, to a degree, our national media makes it tough on us because they're always telling us about the obstacles. It's exactly these obstacles that each candidate from Kingston and the Islands claims they are best suited to help students overcome. Keep this in mind as you go to the polls on October 25th. Remember, your vote does count, so don't forget to cast it, and I'll see you at the polls. Reporting for Studio Q, I'm Kevin Rex. If you haven't yet decided where to place your vote, CableNet is hosting a live show that airs Thursday night from 7 to 8.30. It's your chance to personally speak to the candidates and ask them any questions you might have or possibly even give them a piece of your mind. The one I'm most impressed with is probably Mel Hertig, except uh, his party has never led any, any kind of uh, uh, province or municipality or, or any, they have had no, no chance in power yet. I think uh, John Chrétien is the most impressive and, well, I don't really have much to say about the others. I hate them all, but I'm voting Liberal for Jean Chrétien. Okay. And I wish more students could get involved and more students were interested. Yeah. Preston Manning. It's good. Why is it good? Why is he the most impressive? Because the only person who's telling us that it's going to hurt and it's going to hurt. Uh, Kim Campbell, to me, is the most impressive. I'm going for Preston Manning. I really don't have a most impressive candidate. I have no idea who I'm going to vote for. I'd just like to tell you that the most impressive candidate is Doug Henning. Uh, he's very impressive, and he's also the least impressive, uh, being a magician and, uh, well, having no credibility. Most impressive right now, I'd probably have to say, would be Kim Campbell. They all suck. Hmm. Actually, Audrey McLaughlin's been really pretty impressive. I haven't watched anything. I haven't watched TV, haven't even read the newspaper. I'm trying to get my work done. I have no idea who's running. Audrey. She's terrible. She's just awful. She's a, she's a kindergarten school teacher. She's terrible. None of them are any good. Well, they're all saying, they're either liars or they're saying the same thing. On the entertainment scene, Studio Q spoke to the inbreds. Heather McDermott followed them around on Tuesday night and found out exactly why they're known as Kingston's smallest band. <laughs> have been part of the music coming out of Kingston since 1992. They are a duo comprised of Mike O'Neill on bass and Dave Ulrich on drums. The absence of guitar may surprise some people, but for being known as Kingston's smallest band, they have a very big sound. Their victory at Alfie's 1993 Battle of the Bands allowed the Inbreds to finance the recording of an upcoming 21-song CD entitled Hilario. Dave Ulrich is also the key founder of Probiscus Funk Stone, which promotes Kingston area bands. The PF label, as Dave and Mike explained before their show last Tuesday night at Alfie's, 
is responsible for the increased exposure of the inbreds thanks to a collective PF performance held in the Toronto area. We did a PF show at a place called the Ultrasound and that was uh, with uh, Stonecutters, Los Sea Monsters and ourselves and that was that was probably the biggest show we've ever had in Toronto by ourselves, so sort of like as a group or whatever. It turned out really well. A lot of people came in. It was a Monday night. Um, that was the times we got played on CFNY or our, our music, and uh, it turned out well. From there, we had more shows, and it, uh, we were able to play now on a semi-regular basis in Toronto. In addition to their continued success of live shows, the Inbreds recorded a video for their single Prince, which aired on Much Music's Indie Street this past summer. I shot on video, which is only unusual in the sense that we didn't have any money. So we shot it on video and it was edited, uh, it was edited at, our, at our old high school in Oshawa, actually, for free. So the whole thing was free and uh, it was done with the help of my brother Bob. It was a side and, uh, and we shot it, we shot it at uh, the Kingston Quarry and uh, some of the shots were um, at, on my doorstep on Earl Street and another one is in uh, um, McDonald Park. are playing the Toucan October 28th and November 11th, as well as Alfie's November 17th. Look out for their CD release entitled Hilario at the end of next month. I'm Heather McDermott reporting for Studio Q. So Shari, have you been watching any of the baseball lately? Uh, not really. I've managed to squeeze five seconds in, in between midterms and organizing this weekend. I know how you feel, but I think most students are in the same boat. Brenda Marshall took a camera to some of the local bars to find out how students are dealing with the fall crunch. Fall term is well underway now, which means midterms, essays, and profs are expecting you to have actually started work on your thesis or term project. And still there are other pressures in the so-called carefree student lifestyle. The World Series is on. Homecoming's coming up this weekend. How are people supposed to get by? Well, camera person Vic and I have taken the night out of our busy schedules to do an investigative report and find out how people are coping in these difficult times. This is a study notes. break, a really long place. study break. I'm going to study. Who cares about studying? <laughs> I'm trying to relax, keep my confidence level up. I'm just taking it day by day and, and playing it for the team. While some people are out having a good time tonight, others are not. What is it that drives these tortured souls to the pursuit of academic excellence at any cost? We're going to find out. I'm keeping score right here and do while I'm doing my uh, studying listening to it on the radio. Well, actually, I just did a World Series problem. <laughs> and he's keeping me updated. I'm not very, a very big baseball fan. So. Saving myself all up for homecoming weekend. Well, that's enough nobility for one night. Back to the action. Oops, doesn't seem to be going on at Alfie's. Huh, ah, this is better. <laughs> well, I think it's all a question of time management. You have to allot for schoolwork time and football time for homecoming and, you know, and of course leisure time because without that, you know, you're nothing. You can't function normally without being able to kick back and relax every once in a while, have a couple of beers in a bar like the Shot and lots again. This is, uh, this is a busy time for me. Uh, I'm the alumni weekend chair as well. And, uh, Keeping me on my toes. Yeah. Well, we're playing. We're playing for massage right now. So if I win, I get a wicked massage, and that's how I'm dealing with the stress. I'm Brenda Marshall, reporting for Studio Q. Next week on Studio Q. We thought they were gone, but they couldn't find jobs. So now they've come back. All together now? Ba, 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 ba. What happens when you take two Studio Q alumni and let them loose on Alumni Weekend?
We don't know, but you'll want to find out. Next week, Ron and Kevin's Alumni Weekend Adventures. You've got to bring lots of kippers and speech. Only on Studio Q. On the weekend, the men's and women's volleyball teams tipped off their seasons with the Queen's Invitational Volleyball Tournament. After strong performances by both squads, the women finished in fifth place and the men captured the bronze medal. The men's rugby team faced York on Saturday and embarrassed the Yeoman to the tune of 29-0. This victory placed Queens in a two-way tie for first place in the OUAA standings with McMaster. This Saturday, these two powers will clash in Hamilton in a game which will decide first place. The football team suffered another disappointing loss on the weekend, this time at the hands of the last place Ottawa GGs, who nonetheless managed to rout the hapless Gales 34-12. Despite this loss and a less than sensational 2 and 4 record, Queens could still make the playoff with a victory over McGill this coming weekend at the homecoming game. In other sports action, the women's soccer team played Toronto to a 1 1 tie on Saturday, giving the Gales a fantastic regular season record of 7 1 and 1 and sole possession of first place in the OWIAA's Eastern Division. The men dueled Toronto to a 0 0 tie, leaving them in fourth place with a playoff berth against either Laurentian or Toronto. The field hockey team journeyed to McGill on the weekend, where they suffered a 9-0 loss to Toronto and a 2-1 loss to York, but managed to beat Trent 6-0. The men's hockey team opened up their season with a pair of victories, beating Ryerson 7-1 and Laurentian 4-2. For Studio Q Sports, I'm Paul Bertrand. We have a couple of giveaways on this week's show. The first is a t-shirt from Downtown Workout, and the second is a gift certificate from Mexicala Rosas. So the skill testing question this week is, uh, give us the name of the leader of the National Action Committee on the Status of Women. Uh, and the hint is that she spoke here on Tuesday night. So if you know that, call us at 541-1040. And the answer to last week's question of who is the present elect of Queen's is Dr. William Leggett. And we'd like to con congratulate the winners, Brad Weening and Rob Camp. So that wraps up the show for this week. Don't forget all of the action going on this week. The Queen's game against McGill at Richardson Stadium on Saturday at 1 o'clock. And, of course, the Jays clinching back-to-back -back World Series titles this weekend. And don't forget the exciting concert on Saturday night featuring the Pursuit of Happiness at Jock Hearty Arena. And, uh, once again, if you have any questions or comments with regards to the show, drop us a line at Studio Q, Room 22, JDUC, Queen's University, K7L, 3N6. Or give us a call at 545-6699. So that's it for this week. Thanks for watching. I'm Graham Abbey. I'm Shari Ross. Have a great weekend. Happy homecoming! <laughs> See ya. See ya.